Hey guys, Joe here. Doing something today, as you can see here, as soon as I get my hand off the microphone, we have a 2016 Chevy Corvette Z06. This was the one that was sitting on our showroom for a while and we did find a buyer for it. However, the buyer does not like the silver painted wheels, especially with all the other black accents. So what we're doing is going ahead and swapping them out with the black wheels. So I get an opportunity to drive the car. Yay! Continue this announcement. <laughs> this guy's never turned on his own star. That's kind of funny. Also feels like he never wore his seatbelt yet. So yeah, first opportunity ever to drive a Z06. One thing that Chevy pioneered that I really love is the heads-up display in these cars. Really easy to read, looks real nice. Now, obviously, since this is a customer's vehicle, I'm not gonna beat the crap out of it. I'm going to drive it as if I break it. I owe him a $100,000 car. These are the upgraded seats, the luxury package seats, I guess they're called. So we'll see how those do. You ever gone the wrong way? So this is the Z06 3LZ package, so it does not have the carbon ceramic brakes or anything like that. This one is just your standard everyday Z06, if that statement makes any kind of sense. Uh, it's kind of funny, my buddy was afraid to ride for some reason. I don't get that. He's a puss, that's what it is. This car has the carbon fiber trim package, which on the 16 is a $3,000 add. On the 17, it's actually a lower price point and it's not considered special anymore. It's only $1,000, but it does the same thing, which is kind of weird. I guess either the cost of carbon fiber has come down enough that they can make it cheaper and just include it or whatever, they just decided to throw it in. This car, of course, makes 650 horsepower, 650 foot-pounds of torque, and sorry if I squint a lot, uh, this has the glass or the see-through polycarbonate roof. This vehicle was originally $97,000. I mean, I finally get to drive a car that was almost hundred grand. Most expensive car I've ever driven. I've driven a GTR, but that was when they first came out. They weren't 100 grand when they first came out. They were what, like 75, something like that. So this is the most expensive car I got to drive. I did move a 760 Li once that I was painting, but I didn't get to take that home, so that doesn't count. This has the ginormous rear tires, but it's actually riding pretty, pretty quietly. I'm impressed. It's not the Sport Cup 2 tires that are on the Z07 package, but they're still quite sticky. Considering the car has 403 miles on it, now I'm actually kind of surprised at how much wear there is on the tires that are on it. Sorry if you've moved a little bit. Unfortunately, the camera mount wasn't as secured as I was thinking it was, and it fell. Traffic. I'm pretty sure the steering rack is the same between the Stingray and this, but it, this one just feels a little bit tighter. I'm not sure if that's just perception or if it actually is or not. And again, I am actually surprised at my seating position being somewhat decent. Hello. On for a half mile. This is an impressive machine. Yeah, the torque coming on so fast is very impressive. That makes a lot of difference when it comes to sporty sports sports cars. Sorry, adjusted you again. Wow, very sensitive throttle. Probably even more sensitive than that Stingray I drove. Could also be that I got big old cloud hopper shoes, but I think the throttle's a little bit more sensitive here. The vehicle is in track mode. I'm not touching any of his settings. I did decrease the rear bolster for the seat a little bit because it was pushing into my back. I obviously don't have the same requirements that he does, but yeah, wow, I like this car. I am sorry that I haven't done new videos for cars lately. I've been working a lot, and the only time I have is usually really late at night or on the way to work right now. So these car videos have had to unfortunately go by the wayside a little bit, and I'm trying to do more of them, but it's it's difficult to get them done. A little bit of room between me and the car ahead of it. Just one little downshift. That'll 
opened it up. This car does have the dual mode exhaust on it or the performance exhaust, if that's what you want to call it. So if I do plant it a little bit, and I'll just do it to raise the revs, I'm not actually going to be going much faster. I don't think he's running premium in this. I would like to also kind of go over another subject where somebody had said that, you know, because supercharger always makes boost, always makes boost. You never have to worry about that. Here's one thing that you do have to take into account. The 6.2 liter V8 and even the 5.0 in my Mustang, they weren't designed specifically to have superchargers slapped on top of them. So these vehicles are not making peak torque at the same point that a engine that was designed only to be supercharged does. For example, my Mustang, when you add the Roush supercharger kit to it, doesn't really make full power until you get to about 3,500 RPMs, 3,600 RPMs. Then it starts to pull up and make more power. That's still the case when you add the supercharger. Yes, when you're adding 12 pounds of boost to the car, it will make more power, but it won't be in its power band until you reach the original engine's power band, especially if all you do is the supercharger. If you don't add a tuner or cams or heads or anything to modify the engine besides the power adder, you are only adding power at the same points in the power band. So if you want an engine that has more low down torque, you usually have to change things like the intake runners. A longer intake runner will allow you to have more torque because it's allowing more air, which allows more power down low if you're naturally aspirated. A shorter runner will allow for more high-end power because it's a shorter distance, more air is coming in faster, that allows it to make more power up, up top. So keep that in mind. So when somebody says, oh, you don't have to wait for boost, it's absolutely not true. Yes, this vehicle is probably in vacuum right now. Let me see, let me pull up the, yeah, right now, I'm at 10 PSI negative right now. When the supercharger's not being used, it doesn't make positive pressure. If I'm in idle, it's still making negative pressure. So that's how superchargers work, my friend. Just because it says supercharger and it's belt driven doesn't mean it's always making boost. Actually, I will tell you when it goes into any kind of positive boost once this light changes, if it ever changes, probably won't change. All right, so I've been accelerating. I'm at 34 miles an hour. I'm in fourth gear in track mode and I'm still pulling five PSI of vacuum. Okay, so enough of that crap about, oh, it always makes boost. Here's another thing I wanna talk about, and I think it's prevalent in this car. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure this guy is not using premium fuel in this car. What does premium fuel do for you? Well, if you talk to some people, they're like, don't use premium fuel, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of money. Well, a premium fuel helps raise its octane rating, which enables the vehicle's engine, or at least it enables it to avoid detonation and knock. And in computer control cars, especially boosted ones, when they detect knock or detonation or crappy gas, they retard the timing on the car. So this is a cam and block engine, so it's one cam, but it still has the ability to vary its timing. By doing that, you're losing power in order to prevent damage to the engine. Now, a lot of high performance stuff and the horsepower drags you read about every year or so, those are done typically using E85. E85 is horrible for gas mileage, but it has an octane rating closer to race fuel. So if you have access to that and you have good injectors and the proper system, you can make way more power on E85 than you can on even premium fuel. However, if your car requires premium fuel, you should always put that in. My Mustang, for example, has a premium fuel recommended sticker in it. It doesn't say that you have to do it. All right, as I was saying about the bad gas, running bad gas is absolutely stupid. You should never do it. And if you do do it, you deserve whatever you get. Uh, sorry, but apparently one of the clips that I had filmed did not process correctly, so it was completely unusable. And of course that clip had to be of the car when we picked it up. What can you do? But 
yeah, it kind of went from me just trying to make a quick video about just dropping off a car to get some wheels put on it into a video about um, boost and fuel economy and fuel types and things like that. And hopefully you guys enjoyed that video because it's been a while since I did a video in a car about a car at all. And I know it's not like a really long Z06 video, but again, it's not our car anymore. So I couldn't really do too much with it. But if you liked that video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed and you want to see more stuff or listen to me talk a little bit, leave me a message. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. You don't have to, but please, if you wouldn't mind, I'd really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the next video is going to be about. If I can film a car, I will. If I can't, then I won't kind of a vague sentence but it's all I can come up with at the time at the very least I'll do a drive-in video so I will talk to you guys later